Well, I am very honored to be here tonight. As an African American from the United States, I had a blessed opportunity in 2001 to go to South Africa. And um, when I arrived in South Africa with my wife, Denisha, uh, some of the brothers and sisters in South Africa with open arms said to me when we arrived, welcome home. Uh, in 2010, I went to Nairobi, Kenya. And when I arrived in Nairobi, once again, some of the brothers and sisters from Kenya with open arms said to me, welcome home. Being that I am a part of the Evangelical Covenant Church of North America, I now once again have come to my motherland <laughs> of Sweden. So I was hoping maybe you could open your arms and say to me, Yes, your cousin from the United States has arrived. Well, I was really blessed by this choir. That was good gospel singing. So I'm, I'm pressured to give good gospel preaching. <laughs> Oh, but see, somebody, somebody lied and said they don't say amen in Sweden. So <laughs> there is a word found in the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 9, beginning with verse 35. The Gospel of Matthew, chapter 9, beginning with verse 35. Jesus went through all the towns and villages, teaching in their synagogues and proclaiming the good news of the kingdom and healing every disease and sickness. When he saw the crowds, he had compassion on them because they were harassed and helpless like sheep without a shepherd. Then he said to his disciples, the harvest is plentiful but the workers are few. Ask the Lord of the harvest, therefore, to send out workers into his harvest field. Chapter 10, verse 1 says, Jesus called his 12 disciples to him and gave them authority to drive out impure spirits and to heal every disease and sickness. Verse 7, Jesus says, as you go, Proclaim this message. The kingdom of heaven has come near. Heal the sick, raise the dead, cleanse those who have leprosy, drive out demons. Freely you have received, freely give. From this text, I want to preach to you on the title, Missional in a Multicultural World. Missional in a Multicultural World world. God, I pray that this would be your message. God, I pray that you would preach Amen. and I would just be the vessel that you are using tonight to speak to my sisters and brothers, your beloved children. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Missional in a multicultural world. Some of you, like me, may remember the black and white television. <laughs> when I was a kid, we, and I, we had a black and white television in my house, and it only had five channels. Oh, man, y'all, oh, so I was blessed. <laughs> Yeah, I guess favor is not fair. I had favor. I had five. Sorry, but I didn't mean to bring that up. 
So uh, till I was about, I don't know, 10, 11 years old, we had a black and white television. But today, uh, I don't have a black and white television in my house. Full color television, HD. More channels than I can count. The world has changed. The first church I ever went to was an all white Lutheran church that was at the corner of the block where I grew up. And when I went, my family was the only black family in this white Lutheran church. From there, my family and I started going to a Baptist church. So we went to a black Baptist church. But one day I experienced something I had never seen before. Kind of, it was like going from a black and white TV to a full color TV. I was riding my bicycle in my neighborhood and I rode past a Methodist church. And there was a gospel choir singing outside. And it, it was, there were people of all races singing in this gospel choir. And there were people of all different races and cultures with their hands in the air, praising God outside. I had never seen anything like this before. It was like going from a black and white television to a television in full color. I grew up in a black and white world, but the world has changed. I grew up in Minnesota, and um, by 2002, Minnesota had the largest Somali population outside of Somalia. Minnesota had the fastest growing Southeast Asian population, Minnesota. <laughs> A fast growing Hispanic population, Minnesota was no longer black and white. It was multicultural. I came here tonight to say to you, we need not fear a multicultural world. A multicultural world is not an interruption to the church. It's a blessed opportunity for the church. The multicultural world. This is the world we live in, sisters and brothers. A multicultural world. I planted a church in 2003 because I had a passion, a desire to reach African Americans who had stopped going to church. So I thought I was gonna start a hip hop church. <laughs> and we were gonna have rap music and very contemporary and young African Americans who had left the church were gonna come back to church. I remember the first Sunday we had our grand opening service. And I was like a scared kid at a school play. We were meeting in an auditorium and I was peeking from behind the curtain to see who showed up at church. And when I looked out, it was all white people. <laughs> My wife was standing next to me. And I was nervous. And my wife says to me, what are you going to do if they all show up again next week? <laughs> but listen, before I could answer her, she said, you're going to pastor them. That's what you're going to do. God has sent these people for you to pastor. But soon... Asians were coming, Hispanics were coming, 
First generation Africans were coming. God was preparing me to be missional in a multicultural world. Jesus, in Matthew chapter 9, is walking around a multicultural world. Yes, it's a Jewish world, but it's a Jewish world under the Roman Empire. It's a Jewish world that contains a diversity of Jews. This is the world that Jesus walked around as he walked the earth in human form. And Matthew chapter 9 begins by saying that Jesus was in a house and a man who was paralyzed was brought in. And Jesus not only gave him the ability to move around the earth, but to one day move into eternal life. Jesus did that. Jesus met a tax collector. The tax collector in Jesus' day represented economic crisis and dysfunction. My country knows a lot about this right now. <laughs> but yet, Jesus <coughs> built a relationship with the tax collector. Then, a man said to Jesus, my daughter has died, but will you come see about her? An interesting request. On the way to the funeral, a big crowd comes because the word is getting out. He healed a paralyzed man. He ate with a tax collector. Now he's on his way to a funeral. Let's see what he's going to do. On the way, a woman with a disease. See, in Jesus' day, if you were a woman, you were an outcast. Especially if you were a diseased woman in Jesus' day. But yet this marginalized, outcast woman pressed through a crowd and touched the clothes of Jesus. And she was healed and given dignity. She found herself. Touching Jesus. Jesus makes it to the funeral. And, and he kicks everybody out of the funeral. He looks at the dead girl and says, my daughter, get up. And she does. <laughs> That's Jesus. <laughs> and it's as if Matthew didn't have any more time in that chapter to tell us everything Jesus did in this multicultural world. So he says, look, Jesus went from city to city, town to town, village to village, and he healed, and he preached. And Jesus looked at this multitude, a multitude of Jewish, Roman, and Multicultural people. Jesus looks at the crowd and the Bible says he has compassion on them. The word in the Greek for compassion is the inside of God. The intestines of God. The inside of God is compassion. When God looks at a multicultural world, it pulls compassion, it pulls love out of God. Here is the question. When the church looks at a multicultural world, what does it pull out of the church? It ought to pull the love of God out of the church. Compassion, justice, mission, should come out of the church when it looks at a multicultural, broken world. It ought to pull the best of God out of the church. Yes. You can say amen if you want to. <laughs> no pressure. Just, you want to. The church in this multicultural world needs a missional, and multicultural urgency. We should look at the world around us 
and have an urgency to bring into that world the love of God, the truth of God, the justice of God the reconciliation of God, the redemptive story of God is what should come out of the church poured into the world around us. If we are going to be missional in a multicultural world, we need a sense of urgency. We, we, we need to be anxious. But that's not all. Jesus says to his followers, the harvest is plentiful, which means there, there are millions of lost sheep in this multicultural world. Too many to count. So we should ask God to send more workers into this multicultural world to be missional. And before they can even get into the prayer, Jesus says, you go. He first sends them to their own people, some of their own lost people. But then later in the Gospel of Matthew, as it comes to a conclusion, in the last chapter of the Gospel of Matthew, we find out that we are to bring the good news, the gospel, to all nations. Not just the Jewish nation, but to every nation, we are to make disciples. We are to bring the love of God, the justice of God, the peace of God, the truth of God, the transformative power of God to every nation, every people group, every language, every culture. This is the mandate. Not only do we need a missional urgency, we need to understand that God has given us a missional authority. God is still saying to the church, go to every nation. The good news is the nations are coming to us. The nations are coming to the United States. The nations are are coming to Sweden. The nations have come to Sweden. And so we don't even have to say, how do I raise all my money to go to another nation? The nation has paid their way to you. <laughs> so going and making disciples of all nations is as simple as open your door, go outside. Don't just stay in the sanctuary. Go out. We must understand we have a missional responsibility and a missional authority. God has said go. You don't have to ask God's permission to love somebody of another culture in Jesus' name. You know, say, Jesus, is that okay? Is that all right with you? Would you mind? No. Go. God is getting, we go. You have the missional authority. We have the missional authority to go and bring the love of God, the justice of God, the peace of God to all nations who have come to us to love them as our brothers and sisters. The welcome home is not just meant for me. The welcome home is a welcoming into the kingdom of God to all nations. Come on, come on in, come. Not into the church, into the kingdom of God. Come, come. An urgency, an authority, and a responsibility, a mandate. Now, as I come to my close, you may be wondering though, but how do I bring the kingdom message the love of God, the truth of God, the peace of God into a multicultural world. Sometimes this can be very intimidating. But I want you to know that there is more in you than you know. Through the Holy Spirit, God has placed a powerful force in you through the Holy Spirit. And I want to talk about this. I want, I want to end by talking about Matthew chapter 1. But before I get to it, I want to tell you a little story. I grew up 
believing with all my heart, I'm black. And that's, that's you know, that's pretty true. <laughs> I'm black. But when I went to my family reunion on my mother's side, I found out that my great, great grandfather on my mother's side of the family was full-blooded Irish. That's right. I'm Irish. My great great grandfather, who was full blooded Irish, married a woman who was half African American, half Cherokee Indian, Native American. And she could trace her roots back to a slave girl named Jenny. That's, that was her slave name, Jenny. But because of her faith on the plantation, they called her Easter. So even in slavery, God was planting a foundation of faith that would impact my life generations later. So even though I live in a world that says I'm black, I, I, I'm, I'm African American, I'm Native American, I'm Irish. <laughs> There's more in me than the world knows. But you know what? Jesus living in me is bigger than that. Because... In Matthew chapter 1, it gives us the earthly genealogy of Jesus. I usually don't read genealogies in the Bible. Huh? It's boring. But they're important. In the genealogy of Jesus, in his family tree, now let me first say, the main thing to know about Jesus' family tree is he's the son of God. <laughs> in the beginning was the word, the word was with God, the word was God, he became flesh. So his heritage is ultimately in heaven. But Matthew 1 is here, so it must be important. Says in the family tree of Jesus, in the genealogy of Jesus, there's Abraham. Did you know that Abraham, his first, his name was Abram. He was born in a place called Ur, U R. If you take a biblical map and compare that to a map today, he was born in Iraq. He's in the bloodline of Jesus. Iraqi Abram is in the family tree of Jesus. He's in the bloodline of Jesus. There's a woman named in verse 3. Her name is Tamar. Tamar was a Canaanite woman, which means she was, would have been considered a cursed person. Because that's how the Canaanites were looked at. Because Noah cursed his grandson, Canaan. This woman is cursed, but she's in the bloodline of Jesus. So even if the world calls you cursed, there's still room for you in the family of God. Now, I need to tell you something about Canaan. Even though he was cursed by his grandfather, Noah, Canaan and his family are the original inhabitants of Israel and Palestine. There was a time when Israel and Palestine, Israelis and Palestinians were in the same family. <laughs> but let me say this. Canaan had brothers, Mizram, Put, and Cush. Do you know that between those brothers, they're the original inhabitants of Libya, the original inhabitants of the Sudan, of Ethiopia? That means that Israelis and Palestinians and Libyans and Ethiopians and Sudanese are in the bloodline of Jesus. Oh, but Canaan had an uncle named Japheth. And scholars say that the Moabites come from Japheth. And the Moabites, many scholars believe, are the mothers and fathers of Europe. Europeans are in the bloodline of Jesus. I mean, you should have shouted right there, but that's all right. <laughs> What I'm trying to say is in the bloodline of Jesus, there are Africans and Europeans, there are Israelis and Palestinians, there are Jews and Gentiles in the bloodline of Jesus. There are cursed people in the bloodline of Jesus. There are scandalous and broken people. There are rich people and poor people. There are people that speak different languages in the bloodline of Jesus. That means that when Jesus walked the earth, he not only walked the earth as the son of God, but he walked the earth as a multicultural human being. When Jesus was hanging on the cross and blood was dripping from his head and dripping from his hands that was multicultural
supernatural blood hitting the foot of the cross and that Jesus lives in you, which means you are bigger than just being Swedish or being American or being Scottish or whatever your ethnic background is. The multicultural, multi-ethnic Jesus lives in you and that makes you a powerful sister. That makes you a powerful brother because the God of heaven and earth, the God who came to earth in human form and gave the paralyzed mobility and gave healing to the sick and raised the the dead lives in you and that ought to be good news brother that ought to be good news sister that means you can go wherever God calls you to go you can preach you can sing you can pray you can lay hands on people you can teach and no race or culture can keep you from being missional amen, amen.